Next bone that we're going to be looking at of the upper extremity is the humerus. So I currently have, again, a right humerus pointed up on the table right now. So we're looking at a superior view, this being the proximal end and this being the distal end. So we're going to go through a few bony landmarks that can point you in the right direction of knowing what is, again, proximal, distal, medial, lateral for the humerus. One of the easiest landmarks to kind of look at is obviously the huge, large, smooth articular surface here known as its head. So this head is a proximal bony landmark that faces medial. So I'm just going to move this bone just a little bit this way. So we're looking at an anterior view with this head facing medial. We're going to take a look at another one here. This next bony landmark, very similar and close to the head, is this nice, large, deep groove cut into the bone. And this has a couple names, but for now I'm just going to call it the bicipital groove. So this bicipital groove is facing uh, anteriorly. I'm going to rotate it around to the backside so you'll see there's no groove on the posterior aspect. There's our lateral view. And then again, back to our anterior view with this bicipital groove. So I know that the head is proximal. It's also medial and this bicipital groove is anterior. Therefore, I should be able to determine already just from that that this is a right. But we're going to take a look down towards the distal end of the bone where you have quite a few little bumps on this side. So again, placing it back on the table here, we're looking at this round object known as the capitulum, which is going to be articulating with the radius, which is on the lateral aspect. And then you have the trochlea, which is articulating with the ulna, more on the medial aspect. So looking at a distal end, you have capitulum and trochlea, lateral and medial. So that might help you in finding out what is right versus left. We also have a much longer lateral supracondylar ridge versus if you look on the inside, this is a much shorter one. So the shorter medial versus the longer lateral supracondylar ridge. I'm going to point out one more landmark on this bone. Again, a nice hole. My thumb can fit inside that entire thing right now. And this is for your olecranon. So the olecranon of the ulna goes into this. So this is known as your olecranon fossa, and that is a posterior landmark. So again, nice and easy. We got a head and a bicipital groove. That should be enough for you to determine left or right, but you can use some of the landmarks on the distal end, like the capitulum, trochlea, or the olecranon fossa to help orient yourself with left and right. Continuing on, we're gonna now go through all of the specific bony landmarks here on the humerus, and I'd like to start with the proximal end of the humerus. So, and just in the previous portion, we've already discussed that this was the head of this humerus. It's a large, articular, smooth surface. So this is one part of your glenohumeral joint. So I'm just gonna bring the scapula in here, just so we can see that. So I have our scapula in an anterior view, and I have the humerus in an anterior view. And so this humerus is sitting inside the glenoid fossa of the scapula. And so here is an abduction, just for you to have an understanding, or some flexion, but this is now called the glenohumeral joint. So glenoid coming from here, gleno, and humeral being the head of the humerus, making the GH or glenohumeral joint. So there's the head of the humerus. And for those of you that are interested in that, whatever there's a head, very stereotypically, there's gonna be a neck. So just this thin narrowing of the bone just after the articular surface is known as the anatomical neck. But if we looked past all the main bony landmarks, approximately where my fingers are, this is known as the surgical neck. Okay, so the head, the anatomical neck versus the surgical neck. Okay, putting this bone back on the table completely. This bony landmark right here is known as the lesser tubercle. I'm gonna bring that up for you to see a little bit better. So we have the lesser tubercle of the humerus. I'm gonna rotate it and change the angle slightly. And all of this right here is known as the greater tubercle of the humerus. There is a deep cut groove in between the two of them. This groove has two names. So because we've just described both the greater and lesser tubercle, this is often known as the intertubercular groove or sulcus. So in between tubercles, sulcus, if you wanna think about it that way. So intertubercular sulcus between the 
lesser and greater tubercle of the humerus. The second name for this bony landmark is due to what goes through the groove, which is the long head tendon of your biceps brachii muscle. So oftentimes a simple name for this is known as the bicipital groove because of, again, what goes through it, that tendon of biceps brachii. So either one of those two names is appropriate for this bony landmark. I'm just going to point out that it's quite long. So again, you can see this groove starting running all the way up and that tendon follows this pathway and then goes up into the scapula. So oftentimes a mistake or an error is made that it's just in between the greater and lesser tubercle, but that groove actually extends quite a bit down the shaft of this bone. As we take a look at the greater tubercle of the humerus, you might notice there's a couple flat spots on it. So towards the superior aspect, just as it's kind of named, this is the superior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. As I rotate it, you're looking towards the posterior view. We have the middle facet of the greater tubercle. And finally, we have the inferior facet. So superior facet for your muscle known as supraspinatus, the middle facet for the infraspinatus, and our inferior facet for the teres minor muscle. So again, everything that I'm kind of showing you in my hands right here is the greater tubercle of the humerus, the very proximal and lateral aspect versus the lesser tubercle here, the insertion of a muscle known as subscapularis, again, just this portion of it, and that bicipital groove. Okay, so we've discussed that proximal end of the bone, and we're going to make our way down more towards the middle of it. So I'm going to put it back in the center of the table here. As we work our way down towards the middle of this bone, if you took a look at it from end to end and made an approximate guess of right in the middle, which is where approximately I am here, you will see that it's slightly raised on this outer side. So I'm going to try to bring that up towards the camera and roll it out a little bit. Sometimes on these plastic bones, they don't do a great job of showing you exactly where this is, but there's a slight raised area right in here. And this is often perforated on human bones since you have a tendinous attachment right in there. And that is known as the deltoid tuberosity. So it's halfway down the lateral shaft of the humerus, just a slightly raised area, the deltoid tuberosity, and that is for the insertion of the deltoid muscle. In a similar location, I'm just going to turn this bone over. I'll do this nice and slow. So I'm rotating us over to a posterior view. And again, we're in that same spot about halfway down. I'm going to play with the light here a little bit and see if we can get the light to shine correctly. But you're noticing with the light that there's almost a line that's created where I'm running my finger along. So this line, or a very shallow groove, is actually for the radial nerve. So this has a couple names as well, but the first one is known as the radial groove. The secondary name for this is because it's actually spiraling around the humerus. So the spiral groove is another name for it, but traditionally a lot of people call it the radial groove. So if we look at that, it's starting proximal and medial, and it's heading inferior and lateral approximately in the middle shaft of that bone, right into this area right here. Now that we've covered some of those middle landmarks, we're gonna go down towards the lower half of the bone, the distal half of the bone, and we're gonna discuss a lot of the landmarks happening in this area here. So we're gonna discuss the two widest points as well as that entire articular surface. So as I'm sliding my hand down this we go back to the top just give you that visual this is the outer part of the bone the lateral side of the bone this is known as the lateral supercondylar ridge however just to give you a concept of why it's called supercondylar if i grab this whole lateral end of the distal bone this is often referred to as the lateral condyle which is primarily that articulation point so with one hand my left hand right now i'm grabbing the lateral condyle and with my other hand, I could be grabbing the medial condyle. So discussed for this articular surface of each one, that is why this is called supercondylar, is because it's above the condyle on the lateral aspect. And then on the other side, this is known as your medial supercondylar ridge. If I follow my finger all along the 
lateral supraconductor ridge. It's quite sharp. This is going to be some muscle attachment for brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus. It's going to end at a point which is known as your lateral epicondyle. So on condyle is another way to think about it. So we have lateral condyle, we have lateral epicondyle, and then I have a lateral supercondylar ridge. The lateral epicondyle is going to be the main attachment for your common extensor tendon, which is going to have a lot of muscle attachment going down into your forearm. So we'll discuss that at a later time. If I run my finger along the medial supercondylar ridge, similarly, it's going to end at the medial epicondyle. So you have a medial condyle, we have a medial epicondyle, and we have a medial supercondylar ridge. The medial epicondyle is going to be the main attachment for your common flexor tendon. So again, we're going to have a bunch of forearm muscles coming off of a common attachment here. All right, let's look at some of the details of this bone. I'm going to turn it for you. So we've discussed this in the previously, but this bony landmark right here, which has a nice round shape to it, is called the capitulum. And this is going to be for the articulation of the head of the radius. So the capitulum and it's going to have the head of the radius kind of articulating along that. When we show the radius, I'll put a view for that up. And then this kind of spool-like shape here is known as your trochlea. So the trochlea and the capitulum. Now a nice way of rhyming that is the capitulum is going to be in line with your thumb and the thumb being in line with the radius. So the head of the radius is looking at this object here, articulating with this object, and a trochlear notch of the ulna is going to sit on this trochlea of the humerus. The reason why I brought both of those bony names up is because above both of them there's actually a fossa. So I have a fossa in this location here as well as in this location here, and those fossas are named for what goes in them. This being the capitulum, which articulates with the radius, well, when you go through flexion of the elbow, the head of the radius is going to go inside this fossa, which is why it's called the radial fossa. If we now look at the trochlea, a very specific part of the ulna, called the coronoid process, is actually going to go up into this fossa, so we call that the coronoid fossa. So trochlea of the humerus, coronoid fossa of the the humerus, the capitulum of the humerus, and the radial fossa of the humerus. I'm going to turn this bone over to a posterior view, and we can still see the trochlea. So that's quite something of interest, is that the trochlea is visible from both an anterior and a posterior view. However, the capitulum is almost pretty much gone. So the capitulum is primarily an anterior view bony landmark. You can just see a little bit down in this corner here, but for the most part, the capitulum is not visible. What you do have is another fossa on the posterior aspect, which I use to identify the posterior surface. However, what's going into this one is known as your olecranon process. So the olecranon process of the ulna goes into this opening, therefore this is now known as the olecranon fossa of the the humerus. So again, when I bring out the ulna, I'll show you the distal end of this humerus one more time and show you all those bones articulating. And I have just one more bony landmark to discuss. As we look at the distal end of this, I'm going to remind you with orientation. Here is our head. So this being the medial side, this being the medial supercondylar ridge and medial epicondyle. If I turn this over, there's actually a bit of a groove right here, and that's for a structure known as your ulnar nerve. So your ulnar nerve is going to travel down, go posterior to the medial epicondyle, and go through this groove. So this is actually what a lot of people refer to as hitting their funny bone, is actually striking or making contact with the ulnar nerve. So if you do this very gently, if you find your own medial epicondyle, which we'll show in a different video, you can actually strum the ulnar nerve, which is traveling right through this location. Okay, I'm just gonna put this bone back on the table again. A quick recap, we have the proximal end with head and articulation with the scapula, and you have the distal end with capitulum, trochlea, with articulation with the radius and ulna, and that is going to conclude all of our bony landmarks of the humerus today.